I will be speaking um, for up to 20 minutes on um, what we have learned um, from our research in behavioral decision science, uh, cognitive and social psychology um, at our Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. And um, I'll talk just uh, very briefly about what our center is. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary center um, that combines um, a lot of the social sciences, uh, psychology, anthropology, history, um, uh, economics, uh, but also environmental science and policy, climate science, oceanography, um, engineering, and many others. So we're quite interdisciplinary, uh, trying to understand individual and group decision making under uncertainty. And uncertainty here is either climate uncertainty uh, related to climate change, but also climate variability, the seasonal to interannual climate variability as it affects agriculture uh, and public health, um, but then also environmental risk. Uh, in more general terms. Uh, we look at both adaptation and mitigation in our work, and um, we conduct our research both in form of lab experiments um, as well as field experiments. Um, so um, let me go back. It's, um, Indeed, behavioral uh, decision science has um, uh, a lot to say about how to motivate people to take action, how to shape uh, people to behave in individually um, and socially more beneficial ways. Um, and decision science and psychology are starting to be looked to for best practices. Um, but in many ways, we don't have the magic bullet. So I think that's important that we have to keep in mind also for this conference. This is not the, the one and only thing that we need to, to look at. Um, it's also true that the social sciences um, have shown great success or have shown successes in how people can adapt to climate change. Um, some of our work deals with offering um, small farmers in uh, East Africa uh, loan mechanisms and insurance mechanisms uh, tied to index insurance uh, that helps them adapt to climate variability and eventually to climate change, um, um, hopefully. But the situation is more complicated than offering loans or adapting uh, cropping mechanisms to achieve higher yields. Um, there are many other issues that we, to, we need to look at. Um, and that's why I want to talk about some of the barriers uh, that get in the way of good decision making, but also offer some um, suggestions for how we can change our communication about climate change so that um, uh, all this information that we are producing will, f will fall on open ears. Okay, um, what are some of the main barriers? Um, uncertainty is probably the biggest uh, barrier to uh, decision making uh, or to behavioral change. Um, there's uncertain uncertainty is uncomfortable. We have a great need for predictability. Um, there's uncertainty about nature itself, the uncertainty that is inherent in any kind of forecast or projection that we make about climate change. Um, there's uncertainty about the greenhouse gas control mechanisms that we're proposing, uh, will they work? What are the unintended consequences of them? So there's that uncertainty. In addition to that, there's the interpersonal uncertainty. Uh, the uncertainty about whether others will adopt the technology. Am I the first adopter? Will I regret if this turned out to be a foolish thing to do? Um, there's this fear of isolation. Uh, and often, the coordination is required in order to successfully deal with uncertainty. Um, the second major barrier is public risk perceptions and attitudes. Perceptions matter and matter more than facts in many, uh, for many people. And um, if climate change or greenhouse gas emissions are not perceived as a risk, this gets at public risk perceptions, then the policies aimed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are not going to be hurt. Um, and policies that would reduce our carbon footprint are hard to implement. And policymakers do look to their constituencies and they look at the polls. Um, and so it's important that we keep that in mind. Uh, similarly, uh, related to that is cultural values, uh, such as worldview, religion, um, and political orientation um, shape perceptions. And they shape the uptake and the willingness uh, to, to receive any kind of suggestions that would, re would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'll just use one example that, um, from our research um, where we were able to show how framing of an issue matters. Um, um, 
We did a study where we tested the public support for CO2 regulation, um, and it varies greatly by political orientation. Um, when we, we, we had two frames. One was presenting the information, the um, greenhouse gas emission uh, regulation as a tax added to the product that you buy, either an airfare or an appliance uh, or an offset. And we told people that the uh, revenue from the tax and the offset were used in exactly the same way in order to um, educate people uh, in, in, uh, about renewable energies, etc. So the revenue would be used in the same way. The difference between Republicans and Democrats or people who self-describe self themselves as oriented towards Republican versus um, Democrats uh, varied greatly. So um, you can guess, like, <laughs> among, the, among the Democrats, it didn't matter if it was labeled tax or offset, but for the Republicans, it mattered greatly. Uh, tax was a total turnoff, and, um, and only this one word made this big difference. And I think this afternoon, when Tony Lazarevitz will talk, we'll hear more about political orientation and cultural values, how it influences people's perceptions of climate change and uh, strategies to mitigate. Um, then myopia, the biggest issue probably, um, cognitive short-sightedness magnifies the immediate costs and the sacrifices associated with environmentally friendly behavior or environmentally uh, responsible um, purchase practices. Um, then um, people's goals matter. Um, Climate change mitigation is often associated with personal sacrifice and or perceived as detrimental to economic growth. So people face this dilemma between self-interest and um, the longer-term benefits to society or the environment. And I'll give in a minute an example of an experiment that we did that showed how we can possibly overcome this barrier of uh, focusing on self-interest and, uh, and the immediate goals. And because people have multiple goals, uh, everybody has multiple goals or, and even conflicting goals. We play different roles in our lives as, as a parent, as uh, the CEO of a company, as a member of a church, I could go on and on. And there are conflicting goals and if we can tap into the social goals the, or what John calls the other regarding preferences, there's a difference between the psychologists and economists in, in wording, um, then uh, we may have a chance to motivate social goals and, and uh, activate the non-self-interest uh, motivations in people. So in a minute I'll have like an example of a research experiment with it. Um, the last barrier that I want to point out here is um, that the um, communication and processing of information uh, uh, needs to be taken into account by the communicator of the information. The typical abstract science um, based information that we normally um, put in front of people in form of uh, graphs and, and, and scientific charts does not resonate with people, or at least it hasn't for the last 20, 30 years. So, um, because most people don't turn these abstract uh, images and concepts into something that they can relate to, into powerful images. Um, so the, the average person doesn't elaborate, they don't, they don't linger over these graphs, not because they're not capable, but humans try to do put in the least effort um, that we can, that we can get away with. The other thing is that we also look for confirmation of what we already believe. This is called the confirmation bias. We seek out information that fits with our mental models of how we understand the world, our mental model of how the world works. And I'll have another uh, little example of that in a minute. Um, so let's go into um, this like self-interest versus collective uh, interest or social goals. And um, I'll show um, a work that was done by our uh, graduate student, now postdoc, Poonam Aurora, uh, in collaboration with uh, David Kranz, uh, one of the co-founders of our center.